start by welcoming um, all of the participants to this conversation. Uh, a year and a half ago now, I was asked uh, by folks at FEMA uh, to undertake some research uh, into how our schools could better serve our communities in a post-COVID era. Uh, it's clear that there will be infrastructure investments that will be made all across the country in both urban and rural schools uh, to uh, really begin to implement uh, some of the learnings that we've picked up from COVID, uh, the sense of isolation uh, that uh, communities and parents sometimes feel from their schools uh, has been uh, exacerbated uh, by the pandemic. And uh, what we've seen is that there are gross disparities uh, in terms of learning outcomes and school engagement um, across our communities, particularly around issues of race. Um, we all know that it's time for change uh, in terms of the way we educate our children to uh, enter into uh, the marketplace and to be civically engaged. The question is, how do we make those changes take place? And my expectation is that part of what we'll talk about uh, today with a strong focus um, on public schools um, is what can we do to really implement change? Um, there are many, many ideas on the table, some of which derive from the design community, uh, some of which uh, result from uh, analyses done by cultural anthropologists. Some uh, have come up from people involved in healthcare. Uh, and community outreach and community engagement. Um, and there isn't yet really a consensus other than that we need to do better, uh, particularly engaging communities and particularly in transforming the way our school facilities uh, provide more of a range of services than they do at this moment. Um, and so I'm uh, looking forward to uh, a dialogue that will take us both back in time uh, to the Rosenwald schools, which helped to uh, transform education, uh, particularly for African-Americans uh, across the South uh, just a century ago. Um, and I'm looking forward to an engaged conversation that really does focus on the challenges that we face uh, both in our big cities and in uh, some of our more rural communities. So. Um, I want to open with that and uh, then uh, bring Andrew into the conversation for uh, the um, precipitation, really, of, of, a, of a conversation about how the past can inform what we do now and what we're going to be uh, able to do into the future with public education. So, Andrew, you're on. Great, thank you, Ted. Um, it's great to join you and it's great to join you all in this conversation. Uh, I am going to share my screen here. And there we go. So I'm gonna start with a simple premise. The Rosenwald Schools program is one of the most transformative developments the first half of the 20th century. It dramatically transforms America. It dramatically transforms the African-American experience, and yet it remains hidden history, and its scope and sweep is largely unknown. This is a portrait of Julius Rosenwald that hangs on the wall of the Noble Hill School in Bartow County, Georgia. That's about an hour up I-75 from downtown Atlanta. Julius Rosenwald was born to Jewish immigrants who had fled religious persecution in Germany. He grows up in Springfield, Illinois, across the street from Abraham Lincoln's home. He rises to become the president of Sears Roebuck and Company and leads the company from 1908 until his death in 1932. And he becomes one of the earliest and greatest philanthropists in American history. And his, and his cause is what later becomes known as civil rights. This is a portrait of Booker T. Washington that hangs above the mantle of the president's home with what is now Tuskegee University. Booker T. Washington was born into slavery in Virginia. 
He attends Hampton College. He becomes an educator, and he's the founding principal of the historically Black college uh, in Alabama, uh, originally known as uh, Tuskegee Institute. And this is a rare portrait of the two men together, printed on fabric and sewn into, into a quilt to commemorate the restoration of the Pine Grove School in Richland County, South Carolina. And at the rededication ceremony, former students and former teachers were invited to sign the quilt, and it hangs today in the restored schoolhouse. These two men meet in 1911. That's 110 years ago this year. We have to remember 1911 is before the Great Migration, which doesn't begin until later that decade. So 90% of African Americans live in the South. And public schools for African Americans are mostly shacks, with a fraction of the funding provided for the education of white children. And many jurisdictions do not even have public schools for African Americans. And so the two men create this program that becomes known as Rosenwald Schools. They reach out to the Black communities of the South. And this is a portrait of students and teachers in front of the, what becomes the Jefferson Jacobs School. This is in the 1920s in Eastern Kentucky. They reach out to the Black communities of the South and they say, if you will contribute to a school because we want you to be a full partner in your progress, and if you will reach out to the school board, the white school board, because we want to deliberately establish black white dialogue as a foundation for future progress. And these have to be public schools. While we welcome the school board's contribution at a minimum, they have to agree to own, maintain and staff the school, pay for the teachers. If you do those two things, Julius Rosenwald will make a substantial contribution towards school construction. I want to think, think about this for just a second. There is genius in this design. The Black community has to contribute. This is one of the earliest examples of challenge grants in American history. The white school board has to participate. This is one of the earliest examples of public-private partnership in American history. And this program begins in 1912 when the Lochapoca community in Lee County, Alabama becomes the first community to achieve the match to fund a Rosenwald School from 1912 until 1937, when President Roosevelt presides over the dedication of the last Rosenwald School, the Eleanor Roosevelt School in Meriwether County, Georgia. From 1912 to 1937, this program builds 4,978 schools across 15 Southern and border states. And the results are transformative. There are two economists from the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago who have done five studies of Rosenwald schools. What their data shows is that there was a large and persistent black-white education gap in the South prior to World War I. That gap closes precipitously between World War I and World War II. And the single greatest driver of that achievement, and it is an achievement, is Rosenwald schools. In addition, many of the leaders and foot soldiers of the civil rights movement to come come through these schools. Medgar Evers, Maya Angelou, multiple members of the Little Rock Nine who integrated Little Rock Central High School, and Congressman John Lewis all went to Rosenwald schools. Congressman Lewis wrote this extraordinary introduction to my book, and I just want to set some context here. This is uh, the Emory School, the oldest surviving Rosenwald school in Hale County, Alabama, uh, built in 19, around 1915. I had never heard of Rosenwald schools until 20, February of 2015, and I found myself at lunch with a woman named Jeannie Syriac, who originated the role of African-American heritage specialist at the Georgia State Historic Preservation Office, and the story shocked me. I'm a fifth generation Jewish Georgian. I've been a progressive activist my entire life. How could I have never heard of Rosenwald schools? And the pillars of the story are the pillars of my life. And so I went back, I came home and I Googled Rosenwald schools, and I found that while there were a number of um, books on the academic books on the topic, there was not a comprehensive photographic account of the program. And so over the next three and a half years, I drove 25,000 miles across all 15 program states. Uh, of the original 4,978 schools, about 500 survive. Um, about only half of those have been restored. Uh, and I shot 105 of those schools. Uh, the book of this work uh, was uh, 
just published earlier this year. It, it is in photographic terms a bestseller. It's in its third printing. I'll put a link in the chat to the book. There's an exhibition of this work currently up at the Center for Civil and Human Rights of Atlanta, but in Atlanta, but it comes down December 19th and it will travel uh, to uh, a number of major cities, Charlotte, uh, Memphis, Richmond, uh, New Orleans, uh, uh, Richmond. Uh, I'll put a, a link in the chat to the exhibition schedule as well. Uh, but what I want to talk about now is the architectural idiom of the school. I'm going to bring you inside the uh, Emory School because this is an early example. This is progressive era architecture in service to education. Uh, the, the original designs of this program were laid out by Robert Robinson Taylor and a team of architects at, at, at uh, Tuskegee. Uh, Robert Robinson Taylor was the first African-American to attend MIT, the first accredited African-American architect. Uh, and he, um, uh, he and his team, he was the chief architect at Tuskegee. The architecture of this program, it begins with large windows on the left here uh, to let in lots of light because these schools didn't originally have electricity. On the, on the uh, that was on, that's on the left, on the right, these uh, cloakrooms so the dirty outer garments could be kept uh, out of the school spaces. Uh, and this room divider you see in the back, that originally had a set of doors that could be closed off to separate these education spaces or accordioned back to, um, to open up uh, the space so it could be used as a community center after education hours. Uh, this is that is what was known as a one teacher school. This is a two teacher school, the Hope School in Newberry County, South Carolina. Uh, this was uh, this is named after James Hope, who was the state school superintendent in South Carolina, who was so committed to this program uh, that he donated the land to the school uh, for this school. And every county in South Carolina had Rosenwald schools. To give you an example of, the, of how the density of these schools. If you take out Missouri, which joined the program late and only had uh, uh, three schools, only one of which survives today, the remaining 14 uh, states in the program, two thirds of all counties have Rosenwald schools. 80 of, of, Af of counties that had actually had African American school aged children, 85% of those counties have Rosenwald schools, and many of them had a large number of schools. And this is in Newberry County. Newberry County had 26 Rosenwald schools. In fact, across all of South Carolina, the average county had 10 Rosenwald schools. And the reason for that is that the African-American community was not afforded school buses. And so they had to have smaller schools that they could walk to. In fact, John Lewis, in, their in, in this introduction to my book, talks about the bus carrying the white children, passing him as he walked to school. The last thing I'll say about this schoolhouse is that if you go to the, the, the National Museum of African American History and Culture today, you will find in that museum from this schoolhouse, six schoolhouse desks, one potbelly stove, and the original sign proclaiming Hope School. Uh, this is a three teacher school. The design uh, uh, idiom of the Rosenwald Schools program was that the architecture was to be modest. Uh, and that was really for two reasons. One was to save cost, and the other was to prevent um, the ire of the African-American community, uh, backlash, if you will, otherwise known as arson. Uh, and yet this school has a cupola. In fact, cupolas were expressly forbidden uh, in the architectural um, program of the Rosenwald schools because one of its uh, one of the architects that was behind the design of the program believed that cupolas were reflective of church architecture and therefore violated the separation of church and state. But, what you, but remember, the African-American community has to contribute. And, that, and they counted in that contribution cash, land, material, or labor. What you see here is African-American community agency. The community wanted a cupola and they built a cupola. Now, these schools that I've shown you so far, these one, two, and three store, uh, uh, one, two, three teacher schools, all small white clapboard structures, by the end of the program, they're building one, two, and three story red brick structures. Um, this is the Dunbar School in Pulaski County, uh, Arkansas, otherwise known as Little Rock. 
Um, and if, the, if this Art Deco detailing looks familiar, it's because the architect of the Dunbar School was the same architect as Little Rock Central High School. Now, most of these schools were too small to be used for educational purposes. And so very few of them are still in use for educational purposes today. Of the 105 schools that I went to, only five are still in use for educational purposes. So that means that to have preserved these schools, they had to have um, been adaptively reused. These are the Pleasant Hill Quilters at, uh, in Cass County, Texas. Three of these women went to Rosenwald School. Three of them had parents who went to Rosenwald school, Schools. And the woman in the front row in the center, LaJoyce Flanagan, was a teacher in this school, the Pleasant Hill School. These women uh, found their school in great, dis, uh, their, this school had, had gone, gone into great distress. And these women sold quilts to raise the money to restore the Pleasant Hill School and turn it into the community center that it is today. And they meet on most Mondays in the schoolhouse to quilt. Uh, some of these schools have been converted into church halls. Uh, this is the Denby School in uh, Warwick County, Virginia. Some of them are museums. The Warfield School in Montgomery County, Tennessee. You see there are the reflection from the, um, uh, the, the, the light from these nine over nine pane windows that are such an iconic element of Rosenwald School's architecture. But many of these schools remain unrestored. Uh, and are at risk of collapse. This is the Hannah School in Newberry County, South Carolina, that stands across the street from the Hannah AME Church, and the church uh, uh, graveyard has grown up around the school. It's so important that, that there is a, an inherent plea for historic preservation in this work, as um, these are the centers of, of history and memory in our community. And this is what happens the W.E.B. Du Bois School in Wake County, uh, North Carolina, that had collapsed just before I got there. Uh, I'm going to just close on this um, on this image just uh, to tell you uh, the story of how impactful these schools had been um, on the communities that they that they served. These are brothers Frank and Charles Brinkley inside the K Rose School uh, in Sumner County, Tennessee. The photograph of Julius Rosenwald that hangs on the wall has hung in the schoolhouse since it opened in 1923. Frank Brinkley and Charles Brinkley both attended this school. They both went to college. They both went to graduate school. They both went on to become educators. Frank was a high school uh, math and science teacher. Charles was a middle school principal. They have four sisters. All of them came through this schoolhouse. And of those, ten, those uh, six siblings, they all had, they had 10 children. All 10 children went to college. Without this schoolhouse, that legacy may not have happened. So with that, let me, um, I will stop sharing my screen and uh, welcome Ted back to the conversation. And um, I look forward to talking to you further about this history and legacy. Andrew, Andrew let me uh, bring this up to the present because um, you've done some very uh, fascinating uh, historical work here and your images I think are very compelling. Uh, could you talk just a bit about um, what made these schools so powerful? Um, apart from the fact that there were over 4,000 of them, uh, it appears from what you're saying that they also served wider community purposes, that they were located in places uh, that people could walk to, uh, that they were often centers uh, of a neighborhood. And I'll just say, from a, a personal perspective, a number of years ago when um, I was uh, thinking about uh, finding a place somewhere uh, in, in the Southeast to uh, have a second home, uh, there were preservationists in North Carolina who were overseeing uh, the disposition and restoration of a number of these Rosenwald properties. And when the first thing I realized was that uh, they're so centrally located um, and so convenient that they really serve purposes beyond simply teaching the three R's. Could you talk a bit about the culture that surrounded uh, these facilities? So I think that the, I'll tell, I'll answer your question. It's a good question. I'll answer by telling you this story. Um, one of the schools portrayed in my book that is still an active school is the Plaisance School in St. Landry Par Parish, Louisiana. Uh, and I went to when I, I had been to that schoolhouse, and it's it's it's, it's one of those. It was added onto in the 1960s, and so it's it remains an active school. 
And I decided that, that I had to be there very early in the morning because of the way the light worked in this particular location. And so I figured I'm going to be out in front of an elementary school at 7 a.m. I better tell somebody I'm coming. Uh, and so I had called the principal in advance and told her I was coming. And then after I had done my photographs, I went in and introduced myself. And she knew a lot about this school. The schoolhouse was built in 1920. 70% of the money came from the Black community. A Black community that was already being taxed to pay for white schools. And she marvels at this commitment to education, this passion for education in the African-American community. And she says to me, marveling at this commitment, they worked and they strove and they did what they could to make a better life for their children because in their eyes, education was truly liberation. And I took the title of this book, A Better Life from their, for Their Children, from that quote and that conversation, because I think it embodies uh, this uh, commitment that the African, the, the understanding that the African American community inherently had that education was the access point to the American dream. You know, um, in the uh, post FEMA, uh, post-COVID studies that uh, we did for FEMA, one of the things uh, that became obvious is that uh, these kinds of centrally located facilities and schools in particular, because the school building is, is a trusted place within uh, uh, most of our communities, uh, that the school needs to go beyond uh, traditional education, that it needs to become uh, involved with the distribution of health education, um, often with the uh, distribution of uh, information about uh, food awareness and uh, services for seniors and the like. Uh, could you talk a little bit about um, how the Rosenwald schools uh, might be a model for uh, bringing together a range of community services um, that uh, end up ultimately empowering the communities that they serve. So I think there's there's two particular things that I would comment on about that. So first of all, as I mentioned, the, the, the design of the Rosenwald schools from the beginning was that they were to be multi-use facilities, that they were to be used for educational purposes during education hours, but that they would be community centers after education hours. And there's, uh, and I, of course, of the course the time of my doing this work, I met former students and former teachers and historians and preservationists. And I heard all of these extraordinary stories of the community coming together in these schoolhouses with performances, uh, yeah, opera, operettas, uh, political events, that, the, that, the, these, that these did serve a broader audience. The other thing is this, that not only did the African-American community have to uh, contribute to the construction of this school, these schools, but they often had to then dig deeper to fund things like school supplies. And so what these schoolhouses represented uh, was not only the, an, a place for the community to gather, but an institution around which the community had to come together to support its, uh, its mission on an ongoing basis. You know, we're going to be looking at uh, some significant infrastructure investments over the next few years um, in uh, both urban and rural communities. And those infrastructure investments uh, could conceivably involve both new construction and uh, renovations. Uh, the uh, rehab of uh, any of a variety of, of facilities into true community centers. And I think uh, particularly because I see that um, some of our participants here are from Memphis, um, I think of uh, what the um, uh, community in Memphis did uh, to take a former Sears building, ironically, uh, and to convert it into a multi-use facility that has uh, corporate health offices and uh, learning spaces for children. There's a school that's cited in the renovation um, of that crosstown facility. Um, and the community was heavily involved, as I understand things, in bringing about that kind of renovation of an old Sears building. Um, and so the question that I uh, ask from a designer's perspective is, um, how do we program 
both new and renovated facilities in a way that they reach beyond the traditional conceptualization of a school as only being a place for K to 12 kids um, into something that really uh, serves and empowers the communities and the neighborhoods uh, that surround the school. Yeah, I mean, I think that, so I mean, I'll, I'll turn this back to you. I think that these are important questions. I mean, if, if one of the elements of this program was, a, and this is progressive era, right? Progressive era architecture in service to education. Um, what role do you see architecture and design playing uh, in the schoolhouses of the future and in the schoolhouses we need to be building today? Uh, you know, uh, some of what we came upon uh, in our studies uh, was that um, school facilities uh, can combine a number of, of activities. They can become uh, drops for Amazon, for example, distribution points uh, for FedEx. They can uh, replace the traditional uh, uh, mail uh, room with uh, the kind of hotspots that enable people to communicate, and it's uh, particularly interesting to me um, that the Rosenwald schools were uh, funded initially by private sector money by a philanthropist who uh, had an understanding of the needs of, um, of the African American community. And if we're talking about communications and services, one has to wonder whether uh, some of our major communications companies today uh, might not direct through their philanthropic efforts uh, funds into supporting uh, communities of color uh, in developing these kinds of comprehensive neighborhood facilities. What is, what is your understanding of why Rosenwald decided to make this commitment and what his relationship was uh, with Booker T. Washington? So Booker T. Washington, uh, so Julius Rosenwald's um, um, was motivated by his Judaism. He saw America as a safe haven from anti-Semitism, and he saw that safe haven weakened by how America treated its African-American citizens. And he says, I believe in America, but I do not see how America can go forward if part of her people are left behind. And when he meets Booker T. Washington in 1911, Booker T. Washington invites him to come down, invites him to join the board of Tuskegee. And he goes down to Tuskegee in 1911, um, likes what he sees, agrees to go on the board of Tuskegee. But the two men develop this intense friendship and they start saying, what can we do together? And there's this great um, letter correspondence um, that in 1912 morphs into what becomes the Rosenwald Schools program. And it's important to remember, this is one of the earliest collaborations between Jews and African-Americans in the cause of what becomes known as There is a direct connection between the friendship and the collaboration and partnership of Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who marches arm in arm with Dr. King with his white beard flowing, and who famously says when he marches with Dr. King, he felt like his feet were praying. And what happened in Georgia earlier this year and this is not a political statement. This is a, a political fact that John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock crisscrossed the state together for two months in the runoff, clearly developing not just a political alliance, but a very close personal friendship. That relationship between John Ossoff and, John, and Georgia sends its first Jewish member to the United States Senate, its first African American to the United States Senate, that relationship and friendship between John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock stands on the shoulders of the friendship and relationship of Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington. I'm teaching a course this semester with uh, uh, a, a Jewish faculty member here at Northeastern on the uh, rise and fall of uh, Black Jewish relations uh, in this country um, mm -hmm. over the past uh, century or so. Um, and it's uh, always been particularly interesting to me that um, going back at least a century and a half, there um, have been um, uh, strong connections that have been, been built between the two communities. You raise one other interesting question here about how school leaders can work closely 
uh, with uh, local philanthropies, um, particularly in this time of rising stock prices where uh, donations to uh, educational uh, institutions um, really could be made at a substantial level. Uh, to leverage the federal dollars, uh, you raise an interesting question about how one goes about uh, making the connections uh, between communities where there have been affinities, uh, where there are clearly understandings of the nature of hate crimes um, and the need for education, and how we go about operationalizing uh, the ideas we have uh, towards uh, improving the quality of education and the educational outcomes uh, that uh, we would want to see in communities of color generally, but in Atlanta in particular, which has such a diverse and uh, civically committed population. Yeah, I, I think there's an historical context here that's, that's important. Um, education has been the backbone of the American dream since before there was the United States of America. The first taxpayer funded school in America dates to 1644 in Dedham, Massachusetts. That's more than 375 years ago. That's how far back our commitment to public education goes in this country. And there's a direct connection between that, the Land Grant College Act, which creates colleges all across America. That passes in 1862, historically black colleges, uh, uh, created largely in the decades after the Civil War, the Rosenwald schools of the 1910s and 1920s, the educational provisions of the GI Bill transform America from relatively poor to relatively prosperous. Brown versus Board of Education is one of the high watermarks of um, the civil rights movement. And what are we talking about today, right? Crushing levels of college debt, college affordability, um, uh, the context here is that we have a more than 375 year narrative arc in which we understand that education provides the on-ramp to the American middle class. And we have to think about that as an historical foundation, a pillar of American culture that has to be preserved and protected. And if, that, if we use that as our guide, I think that that becomes the North Star for the reform programs that you're talking about. You know, one of the uh, comments that has come in in the chat is around how we go about um, uh, building uh, community facilities, uh, particularly in urban areas where um, a large part of the population we want to reach lives in housing developments. Um, and my answer to that is that one of the things we've learned in COVID um, is that housing developments actually can become centers Mm -hmm. uh, of community building. Um, every housing development, I grew up uh, in a housing development in East Harlem, every housing development has a community within it. Um, that uh, internal community is not necessarily always represented by the Tenants Association as such. Uh, sometimes it's represented uh, within the uh, faith community that serves the development. Sometimes it's centered on the youth activities. But one of the things we've learned under COVID is that uh, centering outreach and community building within public housing developments um, leads to the development of hotspots. Um, it uh, improves communication systems. Uh, there are places within developments where um, it becomes easier to do certain types of online teaching than it might have been in a traditional school. Um, and so housing developments, whether they are uh, in a city or in a more rural area, very often uh, can serve as the basis of a center that brings people together around education, job training, um, uh, economic development, uh, support for local entrepreneurs and the like. Um, and it seems that the Rosenwald schools in their way, uh, particularly uh, when you look at the people who graduated from them and the kind of civic leadership they've provided, the Rosenwald schools were certainly one way of bringing people together when they were young with multiple generations in a way that uh, enhanced community building. Yeah, I'll just simply respond to that by saying that, because I know our time is up here, um, that yes, the, the, the fundamental framework of the Rosenwald Schools program was built on community engagement, community partnership, 
public-private partnership. Uh, and I think that those pillars today um, can all be deployed uh, in, the, in the cause of um, improving our schools. Um, Dr. Uh, Landsmark, a pleasure to join you. Selma